Okay, um, let's get started. Um, I am, uh, my name is Natasha Robinson, um, and I'm going to be um, hosting or facilitating um, this seminar today. I just want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that this session is being recorded. Um, and also that if you do have um, questions or answers, I just want to direct you to the Q&A double um, double speech bubble icon at the bottom, um, which should be easier to, to kind of pose your questions to Sarah rather than the chat. Just help us um, keep tabs on, on all the discussions going on. Um, so I am delighted to welcome Professor Sarah Dryden Peterson um, to speak with us today. This is actually her second time speaking to the, to the Education Department at Oxford, um, although this time obviously virtual. Um, Sarah is the is an associate professor at Harvard Graduate School of Education and she's also the director of Refugee Reach, um, which is research, education and action for refugees around the world. Um, and she's going to speak about the navigational capacities of refugee children and what refugee children wish their teachers knew. Um, so the format for this session, um, Sarah is going to speak for approximately 30 minutes, but um, I really welcome uh, and invite you to, to pose questions throughout the, the, the talk and, and, and the discussion. Um, hopefully, we're trying to kind of hopefully facilitate some kind of discussion rather than um, just kind of uh, chalk and talk question and answer. Um, so please feel free to, to kind of pose those questions throughout. I'll facilitate the discussion um, towards the end and, and um, hopefully pull together your questions and comments um, for Sarah to respond to. Um, so yeah, over to Sarah, thank you. Wonderful. It is just great to be here today. Um, and thank you so much, Natasha, and to all of you who are gathered for welcoming me to this Oxford Public Seminar. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today and very much look forward to the discussion. As Natasha said, these kind of virtual convenings can be awkward for discussion, but I really welcome your questions and thoughts and hope that we can engage on them after I speak. So I'm going to be talking today about ongoing work that our team has been doing in Lebanon with Syrian young people. This project is a collaborative one, and I'm presenting today on behalf of our team, Vidur Chopra, Carmen Geha, Jumana Tauhuk, and myself. What I'm sharing today is also a work in progress, and we appreciate any comments or questions that can strengthen our thinking as we move forward in this work. Within the field of refugee education, we're exploring navigational capacities for unknowable futures, and particularly the role that education plays in supporting refugee young people to navigate current situations inside and outside of school and engage in future building. For this analysis, we're focused on what we've learned from refugee students about what they wish their teachers knew about these processes. Our larger project examines how different models of education contribute to building durable futures for individual refugees and for their local and transnational communities. Based on data collection in three schools with grade nine Syrian refugee students in Lebanon, this analysis examines two specific questions of this overall project. First, how do Syrian young people in Lebanon conceptualize their futures? And second, what do Syrian young people in Lebanon want their teachers to know about how their current education in Lebanon can help them prepare for these futures? Audience, of course, is also um, important as we think about the analysis and the findings that we're presenting. We really have two audiences in mind with the analyses that we've done. One audience is academic, and a second audience is teachers, teacher trainers, and others who are designing policy and programs for strengthening teachers' instructional practices in classrooms with refugee students. So this idea of future building, we find that refugee young people describe building their futures in context of deep uncertainty. Some of this uncertainty is geographic in terms of where that future will be. For example, whether it will be in Syria, in Lebanon, or somewhere else entirely. Much refugee policy is based on these quite static geographic conceptions of refugees' futures, 
a future of return to a country of origin, a future of local integration in a country of asylum, or a future of resettlement to a country that is distant. We'd like to think about a way to shift this idea of future building as being exclusively geographic. We find that these geographic dimensions of future building are further influenced by geopolitics and daily experience of refugee young people. In particular, by what kind of sanctuary a nation state provides recognition, rights, status, when that sanctuary might expire. Does it have a kind of a, a date by which it might expire? Is that date unknown? And the power of nation states and relationships within a context of exile over where and how young people can live, how they can learn, and how they can exercise um, their identities, how they can exercise their agency in social, political, civic, economic life. In the face of this unknowable future, refugee young people generally struggle to determine what kind of an education might best meet their needs now and in the future, and plan for a future of transnationalism that's focused less on geography and more on opportunity. So in trying to understand future building for refugee young people, we see several processes that they describe engaging in, in terms of shifting the focus from geography to opportunity. First is the idea of imagined and plausible futures. The idea of imagined futures, we're thinking about as young people's hopes and imaginings for the long term. They may not have taken any concrete steps in the present towards realizing them, and it's uncertain if any steps they do take in the present could actually lead to the realization of that imagined future. Plausible futures, on the other hand, are instead a set of future possibilities, often for the short term, those that are realistic, that are manageable and malleable, futures for which young people can take concrete actions, even if they're small steps that influence the decisions that they make in the present. It's important to note that these classifications of imagined and plausible futures are not meant to seek some kind of hierarchy of organizing or evaluating these imaginings of the futures, but instead as analytic categories, they can help us distinguish between the many kinds of futures and the associated pathways that our research participants saw for themselves. The second are navigational capacities that young people seek to support them in connecting their imagined futures with their plausible futures. Ideas like street smarts and rules of the game, concrete skills and certificates for social and economic opportunities and participation, as well as practice with connecting these capacities across contexts seeking opportunity not only in a geographically and geopolitically constrained space, but with a more expansive lens on where and how future building might happen. Important to note is that these concepts are relevant not only for refugees, um, but also for many of our young people globally, especially those who are marginalized by race, ethnicity, caste, language, gender, class, and for whom uncertainty in fact is the only context in which they have ever experienced education in schools and education systems that fail to deliver the kinds of future building opportunities that these systems promise. Um, so let's move to the next slide here. In this particular analysis, we're trying to connect the idea of future building to teachers and think about the role of teachers in this future building and the kinds of ways in which young people describe that teachers do and could play a role to support them. So we think about teachers as street level bureaucrats, that they represent the state, but also wield significant discretionary power within classrooms. This obviously varies from context to context in terms of both the formal and informal um, responsibilities and obligations that teachers feel in their work and feel towards the state and how much control the state exerts. So students see teachers as agents of future building in the kinds of decisions that teachers make within the classroom in terms of their pedagogy, in terms of relationships, which I'll get to in just a moment. 
So teachers' roles in developing navigational capacities can be connected to academic continuity, the kind of learning support they provide, as well as these street smarts and rules of the game, kind of teaching and unpacking the hidden curriculum of what goes on in schools in a new place. Teachers also shape aspirations, pathways, and explicitly sometimes attempt to cultivate these kind of navigational capacities that are not only relevant to a particular place in a particular moment, but over time and in this kind of unknowable future. I'm gonna take a step back for a moment just to describe a little bit about our research process. Um, our research site, as I've said, was in Lebanon. Lebanon has the largest number of refugees per capita globally, with about one in four in Lebanon with, uh, who, is, who has arrived in Lebanon. Um, not all have formal refugee status because um, Lebanon is not signatory to the 1951 UN Convention. And important to note is that Syrians are included in the national education system. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but in a nutshell, there's a double shift education system with um, Lebanese nationals attending school in the morning and Syrian nationals in the afternoon. The graph on the slide here that you'll see shows the number of students in public education from 2011 to 2017. The blue line are Lebanese nationals and the green line are non-Lebanese students, including a large number of Syrian refugees, just so you get a sense of the numbers and the ratios of nationals to refugees within the Lebanese education system. In terms of our research design, this study was designed as an ethnographic in-depth qualitative study. We have a sample of three schools in the Beirut and Mount Lebanon area, which have ninth grade classrooms. These schools we selected for a number of different reasons. Two are Lebanese public schools where Syrian students attend school in the second shift in the afternoon. There are Lebanese teachers. Um, and one is a Syrian private school where students, Syrian students attend in the morning shift with Syrian teachers with relatively low cost tuition fees associated with that school. Our research design intentionally focused on students at the school. So we saw students as the center point of our design. You can see in the middle here. At each of the schools, we focused on six students. And with those six students, we did a series of three in-depth life history interviews with each of the students for a total of 54 interviews across the three schools. We also conducted classroom observations, a total of 101 unstructured observations across the three schools, paying attention to the context of the lessons as they related to our research themes, pedagogies, um, authority, autonomy, belonging, decision-making, and relationships among teachers and students and among students themselves. The interviews and observations were cyclical and iterative so that we could talk with students in the interviews about some of the situations and discussions that we observed in class. We also conducted interviews with the students' teachers, um, 16 teachers in total across the three schools. And again, these interviews were done um, in, in for the teachers always after we had done some observations. So we could talk really in depth and contextually about the kinds of decisions that teachers were making um, in school. We conducted interviews with the parents and guardians of each of the focal students um, where possible and did 15 of those interviews. We also focused on um, peer groups, after school day experiences and other key actors as we really thought about the ways in which not just school experience, but also surrounding experiences with peer groups and outside of school influenced the ways in which young people made meaning of their schooling experience. So I'm gonna take a step out before I take a step right, um, that, right down into the data and talk about some of the general overview of our emerging findings. We're seeing four main mechanisms that interact in young people's schooling experiences, that they connect with their capacities to build futures. First, you see in red here are the structures of schooling. So in this case, particularly around the second shift that refugee students attend. Second, the content of what they learn. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about curriculum and some about language. Third, connected to pedagogy, decisions that teachers make, strategies to communicate content. And fourth, the relationships of schooling. Um, and I'll talk some about the elements of those relationships and the function of those relationships. 
So I'm going to talk about each of these four elements, structure, content, pedagogy, and relationships um, as we delve into the findings. So the first around structure, we find that students experience a disconnect between the futures they imagine and are trying to plan for, and this feeling of being constantly behind, as one of our participants said, being behind and unable to catch up. So one of our participants, I mean, used this phrase, being behind, to describe how he felt as a refugee student studying in Lebanon. This phrase really captures the different ways in which Syrian students feel like they are behind. One, the structure of schooling in which Syrians attend school later in the day and literally come to school behind Lebanese students constantly weighs on young people's minds. Refugee students have often also had to miss out on years of schooling because of conflict and displacement and challenges in accessing schools where they are living. Students are often placed in lower classes when arriving in Lebanon. So by ninth grade, the focus of our study, many students really are behind in terms of the year um, grade level for their age and are constantly reminded of that both by their peers and by teachers. Um, and second shift students always describe feeling left behind in the curriculum as compared to morning shift students who have longer hours of study and at times teachers who are more highly trained than the contract teachers for the afternoon shift who often have little support or training. Our participants also felt that they belong to a kind of second class status wrapped up in this idea of being behind as a result of the structure of this shift system for several reasons. They described how morning is a better time to study than the afternoons in terms of being more alert and being able to spend more of the day really focused on your studies and homework. They had less hours of instruction in the second shift than in the morning. The morning shift students had more subjects like computer lessons and drawing. And Syrian students never really felt like the classroom or the school was really theirs because it is first used and meant for, as they said, Lebanese students. Students also expressed a kind of resignation um, about this status. First, I just wanted to share this quote from one of our participants who said, it's like they're giving the school to us so we can learn, but not to be established. So there's very clear recognition that there was some learning going on in schools and students felt like it was that they were exercising their right to attend school by going. But this idea of being established or creating a sense of belonging or feeling like the school could be theirs um, was often missing. But students did express this kind of resignation or almost um, understanding that surprised us in some ways about the second class status. One student said they're Lebanese and their school is Lebanese. For sure, for sure, for sure, there's no country that favors others over their own citizens, right? In Syria, we also have our school and it's not theirs. So this idea that the structures of schooling as um, kind of misaligned as they were with young people's imagined futures made some sense to students in terms of the way in which they were organized based on their understanding of who belonged um, and who had the right to which school first. I'm going to turn to the second element related to content. These illustrations that you see are part of an animation that we're collaborating with Positive Negatives to produce. And these are just some early illustrations, but I think they're really um, important in kind of showing this, in this case, this kind of grappling with connecting the threads of um, oneself and one's life in charting through the past and into the future. So related to the content, this resonates in several ways. Syrian students are following the formal Lebanese curriculum. Um, they are all, every single participant describes completing the official curriculum to enable success on the brevet exam that will allow them to pursue more education as a plausible future goal um, and one that they were working towards consistently and daily. But they also described how the curriculum, the content that they were learning, was really silent on their experiences as refugees on the conflict in Syria and the challenges that they face as young adults. So one student said, what we hear is, don't interfere with politics. We're here to study and not to talk about these issues. 
But following on this observation of what happens in school, this participant said, well, how am I going to figure out my future without guidance, without examples, and without content that relates to me? This connects to the third element of pedagogy um, and this idea that although the structure and the content as young people describe them and as we observe them are fairly fixed, that teachers are able to make more decisions, are able to shift the kind of pedagogy and relationships in greater ways. Students described valuing four elements of teachers' pedagogy. One was really about order. Um, many students described chaotic classrooms in which they had often learned and so appreciated teachers who were able to create a kind of order that allowed for learning and made clear distinctions between what was a kind of um, a, a, a too strict order that didn't allow for questioning and explaining and an order that allowed one to think inside one's head. One student said the physics teacher shouts a lot. All the students have a headache because of his high voice. He yells a lot about everything, and this class is chaotic. Teachers who did not behave in this way, who were able to cultivate this order, were really appreciated by students. The second is this idea of explaining materials and concepts. All of the students in our study described valuing teachers who really took the time to deeply explain a concept, not just as something that needed to be learned that day because the curriculum said so, but really fostering an asking of questions and an explaining of the ideas behind the content. And this was particularly important for students who were struggling to learn in English, having had their previous education in Arabic, where teachers would use explaining, even if they did not shift languages, some did, um, to, to address language issues, to talk in simpler language, to break down concepts, and to make sure that students felt part of the lesson rather than just being talked at. A third element was this idea of balancing strictness with care. And this connected back both to the order and to the explaining. In students describing this, we want, stu we want teachers who are going to maintain some kind of order in their classroom, who are going to be strict about the kinds of um, the ways in which the classroom operates that allows us to learn. But we also are really looking for teachers who will show us care and show us that they are listening to us, that they are seeing us as individual students. And I'll get to this a little bit more when we talk about relationships in a moment. A fourth element that students described about pedagogy was a teacher's approach to sharing power with students in the classroom, which really was about listening and taking students' ideas into consideration. One student described the lack of power sharing in her classroom when she said the student is always made out to be wrong. It is impossible for the teacher to be wrong. Many of us have probably experienced classrooms where this feels like the environment. And teachers and students were really clear that they understand that many classrooms operate without this kind of power sharing. But in the moments where they were able to share power with teachers and to feel listened to, they felt this kind of world opening up where they might be able to connect these imagined futures to the very constrained, plausible futures that they were experiencing on a daily basis. So one student talking about explaining said, he doesn't leave it like this. He explains it and tells us about it, about each phase, about what happened and what they did throughout the lesson. He's kind of a teacher preempting the kinds of questions that students would have, as well as welcoming those questions when they came up. Um, students overall then found that effective teacher pedagogy really supported them to overcome some of the structures and content that felt immutable and created conditions for learning, making more plausible their imagined futures. I'm going to start with two quotes on relationships, kind of mixing up the order in which I'm presenting here. But as we think about relationships, we found that students found unwelcome in many parts of their daily lives and often heard comments from their teachers along the lines of, you Syrians, we are hosting you in our country and this is how you behave. But students also described how the teachers didn't at all make us feel that we were entering a country that isn't ours. And it really felt like they had these bifurcated experiences of some teachers really making them feel like they were a burden um, on the school and on the teachers teaching and others making them feel not at all that they were entering a country that wasn't theirs, but quite on the contrary, that they did belong to this space. Um, 
three elements of relationships really help to cultivate more of the sense of welcome um, for refugee young people. These three elements of the relationships were related to care, dignity, and worth, and equality in teaching. This idea that the refugee young people who felt like they were having access to the same kind of education as students in the morning shift felt like they were, were being kind of playing on a level playing field, learning those rules of the game and being able to access equality or equity in teaching in that way. And thirdly, agency. This idea that teachers who believed in the students and who believed that it was possible to build futures, even if those futures remained unknowable. So these kind of pedagogical and relational messages that young people received and understood about order, about control of what was said, about participation and explaining, were both constraining and enabling for, for Syrian young people in our study, and really shaping the ways in which young people were thinking about and being socialized into how they conceive their, the links between their imagined futures and their plausible futures. So bringing some of these ideas together back to this um, diagram, we're really seeing four mechanisms that interact in young people's schooling experiences, that they connect with their capacities to build futures. First are the structures of schooling, like the second shift and how it really circumscribes how young people see opportunity in their learning. This feeling of being constantly behind and never belonging with, but instead being um, alongside. Second, the content of what refugee young people are learning, like the topics that were covered, the language that they learn in, and the high stakes nature of learning on an exam, including how left out young people felt from the curriculum in terms of how it pertained to their past, to their present, and to their imagined futures. Syrian young people in our study saw these mechanisms, the structure and the content, as pretty fixed um, and things that they didn't think that they could have agency over or that their teachers really had much agency over. So really they focused on ideas of pedagogy and relationships in terms of what they wished their teachers would know about this, the navigational capacities to build futures. So this mechanism of pedagogy, the ways that teachers teach the content that they choose to teach, the way they engage students in materials, with particular importance that young people placed on explaining and making relevant. So while the content itself may be silent on their experiences as refugees, may be silent on conflict in the region, teachers were able to bring into some of their explaining and to some of their pedagogy ways of connecting one curriculum that was very nation state centric to Lebanon to ideas that young people who were not sure where their futures would be and what kind of transnationalism they might enact um, within those conversations. Um, fourth, the relationships of schooling, including with teachers, with other students, and outside of school. Elements of these relationships that young people described as critical included respect, care, trust, support and open communication among teachers and students to really know each other with students seeking teachers support in actively discussing and trying to reconcile their imagined futures and the kind of plausible futures that felt constrained by their access to economic opportunities by their access to further schooling by these feelings of being constantly behind and um, developing a sense of self through recognition and self-worth um, within these spaces. In our data, we see that the most effective teachers from young people's descriptions of them are those who use relationships as the foundation of their pedagogy, and in particular, support young people to navigate the content and the structures of schooling that are fairly fixed through this kind of relational pedagogy that they can build to match the needs of their students at that time. So these four elements in our data we're really seeing as making up the kind of key navigational capacities that refugee young people describe as important to them as they seek to build their futures unknowable as these futures are.
So I'm going to wrap up there with thanks to all of our research participants, um, to my Graduate School of Education at Harvard, to the Norwegian Research Council, and um, to all the collaborators on this project, including Vidur Chopra, Carmen Geha, and Jumana Tauhuk. And now very excited to think about um, discussion with you on your questions, um, what you found interesting, and any suggestions that you might have for strengthening the work. Thanks so much.